The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 378. My name is Chris. And my name is Noah. Hey, Noah, guess what? I'm here. Big show today. And oh, you're here. oh, yeah. It's nice okay. to see you, actually. Oh, it's nice to yeah, see you, I'm too. I'm glad you're here. And you know what? Let's welcome in our chat room, too. Hello over the jblive.tv chat room to our IRC chatters. Welcome to episode 378. Coming up today on the show, we're going to look at System 76's new workstation killer, the Serval workstation. This thing has a i7 3 gigahertz chip in it. Or it might have been 4 gigahertz. I'll get to that in the specs here. A 970 GPU, an NVIDIA 970 GPU, uh, a beautiful, gorgeous display, a great new keyboard. They say one of their best keyboards they've ever, they've ever shipped, and a few other surprises. We're going to review the new System76 based. It also includes NVIDIA G-Sync built in, which is a big deal for us gamers. So we'll talk about that, talk about the gaming performance, how it works at big workstation loads, building software, 3D graphics, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we'll give you all of our take on System76's new crazy machine built for Linux. And then in the news segment, we're going to talk about Chromebooks outselling Windows computers. And a couple of OEMs are getting big into that and what that means for Linux in the enterprise. Then a new s- distribution that is from the, GNU fo- the, from the GNU Foundation, the folks over there. And... Uh, they have a distribution that they say does a functional transactional package manager, kind of like what Snappy claims to be, kind of like what CoreOS claims to be, but it's something for all of us. GUIX is what I think they call it. We're going to talk about that in the show today. GNOME turned 18 this weekend. We'll look back at 18 years of GNOME. And then why Vulkan on Android is actually a huge deal for desktop Linux. We'll talk about that in the new segment. Then some great feedback, some follow-up, some interesting open source artificial intelligence coming in. But before all of that, Noah... We're going to do the picks. We're going to do the picks. It is a fun part of the show. And we start with our Runs Linux this week. This company called Space VR plans to allow us to look out into space and watch the Earth in 360 degrees of awesome VR goodness. And they run Linux. That's right. Space VR runs Linux. And watch their video and we'll tell you more about it. But watch the video for a little Linux here. And why don't you tell us about your awesome plan? Our plan is we want everyone, you and all of you, to be able to be astronauts. (laughs) Awesome. Not just internet astronauts or what? Because going to space is very expensive. True. So we unfortunately can't physically send everyone to space. So what we're doing is we're putting a virtual reality camera instead. That would be our surrogate in space. And it will allow us to experience it as if we were there. So we can all look around and lay back and admire the world as the astronaut sees it. All right, so that's what they're doing. Now I'm going to jump to 4 minutes and 59 seconds in the video. Now watch for the Linux. Okay, I'm watching. Here it comes, Noah. Here. I'm so watching. you're trying to raise oh, half a million dollars? I see so, Linux. I yeah, see there's the Linux right there. They're running Ubuntu, and you can see Unity. And it looks like, uh, what web browser is that there, uh, Noah? Is that, uh, I can't really see from here, hmm, but I'm sure like, it's Firefox. It looks like Chrome to oh, me. That's probably no. Firefox. Like oh, well, it's working, so I'm sure it's Firefox. Yeah, it looks like Chrome. Uh, so now over here at the Kickstarter page, they currently have 404 backers. With uh, They've got a goal of $500,000, and they're at $34,000 right now with 23 days left to go. I'll play just a little bit of their Kickstarter video because it's pretty cool. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen is the Earth from space. On this little ball is everything you've ever known, all of the history, all of your future, all of the beauty of what it means to be human. The word that everyone uses is fragile. From the ground, it looks like the sky goes up forever, and from space, it looks very small. Understanding the Earth from that perspective has enabled us to become better stewards of our environment, of our atmosphere, of our resources. One of the things we want to do with Space VR is consolidating that message and telling it to the world. Most astronauts that have looked at Earth from space and seen them a larger picture have a changed perspective, they have a broader perspective. It was only after my flight that I began to go, I can't be the only one who's had this sort of reaction. And that's when I discovered this term, the overview effect. We would all benefit if we all had a shared experience of this kind. The virtual reality <clears throat> is very well you know, positioned. Right now. I've had kind of a uh, layman's virtual reality tour of the solar system, and it was very cool. Yeah, it was really neat. So there is actually something to going up there and seeing this. To me, that it's one of the missing pieces in the puzzle of how we get everybody to understand the beauty of space. The overview effect has such a profound impact that once you've seen it, there is no going back. I think it can help everyone realize that our problems are a lot smaller than we think. 
inside all of us, there is a drive and passion for exploration to get well, to And they uh, <clears throat> talk about the project. We are, we're giving everyone in the world the opportunity to become an astronaut. They're going to support different types of VR. One is a so box or cardboard included. Virtual reality oh, really? Camera. Designed to capture a live 360 so the, degree view of its surroundings, <clears throat> that showing you the world from an astronaut's perspective. We have done all of the groundwork. We have set up all of the partnerships and the agreements. We have built the camera and gotten ourselves space ready. And everything that we create, we will make available to all of our supporters. One of the experiences we will capture will be from the cupola module. It is the viewing port for the International Space Station. Yeah. From it, you can see the entire Earth at once. Where that is, Janeway the astronaut The experience we create gal will be a available on picture. every VR platform, from Oculus to mobile devices. That's so cool! <laughs> that was life-changing. This will cultivate the next generation of explorers. So many children dream. So anyways, you guys can watch the rest if you want, but uh, what do you think, Noah? Kind of a neat idea. I think it's awesome. You know, the, the thing is, this is one of those things where I depart from most nerds in that I'm not a space junkie, mm, and mm -hmm. so and I know that that's a really popular thing, um, but any place that uses Linux to accomplish their task is awesome. Yeah, and I, I like that uh, even though it seems like the uh, virtual reality market hasn't really come together, there's a lot of different options, yet. there's different standards. Yet. Yet, yeah. right. Yet, but in, but even though even though that's the case, there's still some solutions out there like this that are coming together that like, well, we don't care which hardware you throw at it. We're just yeah. going to work with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might even work with Firefox's web VR and then, or, you know, under, yeah. or, or you just might need an Android phone and Google Man, Cardboard. Man, wouldn't that be the way to go? If it yeah. worked with Firefox's web VR, and yeah. then and then any device that you can get to work on Firefox yeah. would just work with this. Yeah, and then if they added, if they could oh, add cool. web VR support to Firefox Mobile, and then Google Cardboard. He said it's coming. <coughs> yeah, he said it's just a matter of when the build goes. Yeah, through. Yeah, just whatever. like collaborative editing is coming to LibreOffice. Yeah, well, I think it's a little different than that. I think they actually <laughs> have the code there. I think they're just waiting for it to push out. Yeah, you know what I mean. All right, so we have such a great desktop app pick. I'm really excited because it just got a big update, and it's a real contender on the Linux desktop. First, I'm going to tell you about another real contender, though, and that's DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get your own Linux rig spun up in no time. And you can use our promo code LASTDigital. Digital, L A S digital, all one word, lowercase, to get a ten dollar credit over at DigitalOcean. Now, Noah, what was it about DigitalOcean that sort of got you? Because now you have like a jillion droplets, and there's I know for me it was quick Linux systems, HTML five console up in the cloud, really easy to get going. It actually what it was was I uh, previously everything I had done in the VPS space was, was with one of their competitors, and I had a client that wanted to have uh, they they wanted to run specific software on. DigitalOcean, or on on a, on a VPS, and mm -hmm. we tried to use it with the with the VPS provider I was using at the time, and it wouldn't work. And it would it would build it would work just fine in a stock install of CentOS, but when I tried to use it on them, it it, it didn't work. So I contacted ah. their support and I said, "Hey guys, what's up?" And they said, "Well, what's we going use, with this? yeah, they said we use a different kernel." And I said, "Well, that's weird. Yeah. Uh, can we fix that?" And they're like, "Yeah." And I'm like, "Well, what would the time frame be?" And they go, "Yeah, we don't know." And I contacted DigitalOcean. This is actually before they were a sponsor of Jupiter yeah. Broadcasting. And oh. I contacted DigitalOcean and I said, this is the problem I'm having. And they said, oh, we'd love to work with that and fix that. And they, I don't know what they did. They, they did development or whatever and changed yeah. things around. Yeah, and I then got, my software worked. I got a little background on uh, how they worked with the CoreOS project and uh, the FreeBSD team to get both CoreOS and FreeBSD on DigitalOcean. And I was like... You know, it's one of those things where they connect with the projects, they work with the developers, yeah. then now they get like upstream patches and they contribute upstream back. And it's like people even knew that aspect. And DigitalOcean just does that and they don't really brag about it very much. They just work with the upstream projects and it's it's really cool. But what's great for you as an end user is because they're leveraging open source and Linux and KVM, uh, y y the, the pricing is just, it's, it's, it's really the best out there because DigitalOcean really put all of this together. And so you get this, in, in less than 55 seconds, you can spin up a $5 a month droplet, $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. Now, if you use our promo code, last digital, you get a $10 credit. You can try that out for $5, or that $5 rig out for two months for free. Try out CoreOS, or, you know, free BSD if you want. Or, you know, they also have Ubuntu, and uh, uh, they have CentOS, and they have Debian. Um, and DigitalOcean has data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and Germany, so you can pick a location near you. Their pricing plans are really straightforward. So you start with a $5 rig, and if you decide you need a little more horsepower, it's just another $5 a month, and then pretty much everything goes up. You get a gigabyte, you get 30 gigabyte SSD, you get two terabytes of transfer, and then it goes up from there and there. And they also have hourly pricing available, and because they have a really great API, it's very easy to scale up to DigitalOcean when you need them. 
Over 500,000 developers have deployed to DigitalOcean, and you can do it for testing, for production. That's what we use it for, for a little bit of both. It's our Linux infrastructure on demand, and their interface is so straightforward, and their API is so great that it's really easy to extend it. It was I'd super have a, nice. I'd have a hard time thinking of another single service that has been as instrumental as DigitalOcean and saving our rear ends. Oh, I know. Numerous times in hard spots. And it's so nice that it's and all in, built on Linux, and too. And I have a prediction, uh, and I don't know, we'll see what ends up actually happening. But I suspect there is a medium to high chance DigitalOcean may save our hides again come Linux code. <laughs> because I think we might have I think Funny this, how that always happens. Yeah, I, I, know. I, I think there are some I think there are some issues that we're gonna have to solve and I think that Oh you're talking about you're talking about Linux unplugged. Yeah, 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 I am. And yeah. I'm thinking, and I know in in my head, I already have it planned out. So yeah. if S hits the fan, and yeah. you're like, I'm I'm angry, Chris. I need we need to fix this. <laughs> I have yeah, I have I have a plan in okay. my head anyway. Okay, but it involves DigitalOcean. Right, and we'll if, just, they, if they if anything happens to them, we're host. We're done. I got a pro tip for you. Use the okay. promo code Last Digital. You could spend it up two months for free. Oh really? Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Last Digital. DigitalOcean.com. And a big thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. All right, Noah. So we've got to tell you about this desktop topic. You might already be hip to it, but did you know they just released a brand new version? I'm talking about the Atom Editor. What? 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 What about them? What about Emacs? Listen, baby. I'm not telling you to walk away from VI, VI, VI or Vim or, or Emacs or Nano or Pico or what else. Well, well that's what? good because I would say that was cray cray. Or G-Edit even. Not even G yet. Get it. Now, Kate, let's, no, I'm kidding. Kate's great. Uh, or K edit. Uh, now, listen, no, Adam is more for, you get, you're going to be in your editor for a while. You're coming to spend some time. Uh, you're not editing a config file necessarily. You totally could, but this is more, uh, this is more of an interface for actually doing some development. Uh, not what I use it for, but uh, it has, a, it's a, it's very similar to Sublime Text. If you're familiar with that, only it's free. It has a great interface and it supports some really neat features I'm going to talk about. Now, yes, it does have a downside. It's, it's basically like, it's basically a web browser with a local web server, and it and it's like, it when it's 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 you know it's 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 written essentially in like, uh, so um, uh, Node.js. It's not like it's it's not like a lean mean native text editor. This is not what this is for. This is for you're working in something that's not quite an IDE, but you need something that's a big project, something maybe like some show notes that we do or like a, a really advanced shell script. Was, I'm kind of thinking for your use case specifically. Uh, and I want to show it to you, Noah. So it's called Atom, and it's made by GitHub. So for those of us that are uh, software development, the software developmentally challenged, what is the difference between this and an IDE? Well, an IDE is more of like an entire development environment, so like Eclipse. So you're going to create like a Java application. You know, you're going to have a whole like, Whole a whole available of like snippets you can bring in there. And this okay. This is more like this is more like closer to G Edit. Not okay. So you know where like uh, you could so you here's you ever, did you ever use Dreamweaver back in the day? Oh like, heck yeah. So Dreamweaver would be closer to an IDE, and this is closer to Notepad kind of. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, but, All right. But 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 with, but but actually with some really really great features. Uh, uh, it's a very hackable. One thing it's cross platform, so you can have one editor on Windows, uh, uh, Mac, and Linux. That's nice if you move around a little. Bit as smart auto completions, you can write code faster, including markdown support. Noah, oh, multiple cool. panes, including live previews, so you can render out what you're writing in real time and see if it actually renders correctly. It has a built in file system, a really great find and replace system. It can load huge files pretty fast. And Noah, here's the thing I really like about it check this out. It has a package system. So you can go over here and you can search for packages and then you can add functionality to the editor. So say, Noah, that you needed to work in Markdown, right? Uh -huh. You can go over here and search for Markdown packages and then find community created Markdown packages, like a real time Markdown preview package built in to Atom. So now when I'm editing Markdown files, I can get real time Markdown preview in order oh, to make sure that cool. it works. And this is something that you could so use. It, so you think it kind of combines the best worlds of Gedit and Haroopad, maybe? Mm, Haroopad is more just for Markdown, and and I actually think if you're just doing Markdown, Haroopad's probably a better option. Mm -hmm. But uh, because uh, not our audience probably that isn't a huge use case for them. Um, Adam does other things as well. So I also themes is something else you can do. So if you don't like the dark theme, you can change it to a light theme. Uh, and they have you, obviously themes you can go get online. Different different syntax highlighting themes as well. So you can have your high, you can diff have different syntax highlighting packages installed. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Huge community around this to begin with as well. Uh -huh. uh, so it's it's got a lot of legs, a lot of progress. Of course, it's backed by GitHub. 
So it's got... Uh, you sold me. I was trying to install it. Apparently the build is failing because uh, I need NPM. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're on... Uh, it, you can get it on the Arch, yeah. Yep. Uh, and there's also Debs and RPMs available uh, at adam.io. That's the website. Now, the reason why I mention it now on the show is they just released version 1.07, and in my opinion, this helped clean up the speed, and this made it perform a little bit better under Linux. Also, I should probably mention Atom is indeed open source. It's under the MIT license, and um, I just think it's a pretty great product. Oh, high DPI. High DPI support, I believe, is lacking under Linux at the moment. I actually have been using it on a 1080p display for the last few days. And where it just looks gorgeous. Have you had a chance to try it on anything higher? Yeah, I don't think I've tried it on my XPS. It might be installed, but I don't. I don't think I have. I know Harupad is in high DPI, and that's. I use that a little more because it's mm-hmm. just Markdown. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same thing. Adam might be a little faster than Harupad now, though. So, I don't know. If we were, if you know, like. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know, no. I've thought about like using something like this and tying it in with like Git and then just replacing Google mm-hmm. Docs. It just doesn't mm-hmm. do the real-time editing part, but the offline editing part would be really, really nice. So it's adam.io, and uh, you probably know about it, but it's worth another look because they've done, a, they've done some major updates to it recently, and they continue to treat Linux pretty good. So speaking of GitHub, your spotlight this week you picked is pretty neat. It's GitHub's education effort. Yeah, so this is sent in to us uh, by, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Lord Draculate? That's good. Yeah, is that, that's is good. that right? I like it. That sounds good. Um, and so, and I had a chance to meet this this guy. He's a really cool dude. Uh, I, I had a chance to meet him at scale, and he sent this in. <clears throat> and essentially, uh, the idea is that we are going to uh, we are going to use the GitHub like environment. Are, are you familiar with uh, LMS? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so th- uh, is basically what this is, right? It's it's basically this idea that we can use a GitHub like environment <clears throat> to do uh, a lot of the same things that LMS did. And I got to tell you, having having uh, having worked with LMS systems, a lot of them are pretty poor. Um, I know Blackboard's a real popular one. Uh, there's a lot of things that people don't like, mm-hmm. and one of the th- and and one of the things that I noticed right off the bat by looking at, by looking at their GitHub page is that this is built with with the with the heart of a student and teacher in mind rather than the heart of a developer. And what I mean by that is, take Blackboard for example. We have learning modules. What? No, we don't have classes. We have learning modules, mm-hmm. and and uh, and and right off the bat, it, it seemed like everything like the this is more built around showcasing what the students' work is. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that and and actually and, and actually concentrating on the learning and the and the, and the they, lessons. They have so. another aspect to this, and I was wondering if you check this part out because this is the part that I kind of want to talk about for a second, um, because this is something else that I think is maybe good for students, mm-hmm. but maybe also trying to get them to spend money. But they have the student developer pack here. And uh, so they include a few applications with it as like a get started pack. Mm-hmm. But then they also include like m- some steep discounts that are only available to students to some online services. Uh, like the one that jumped out at me was they have a DigitalOcean uh, student discount. Mm-hmm. It's a hundred dollar student credit. Hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, they also have uh, so they also have like uh, like uh, Namecheap. They have uh, they have a uh, an eight a nine dollar a year. Uh, dot me domain for students in here mm-hmm. and like they have links to uh, microsoft visual studio they have a uh, discount if they want if students want to integrate stripe with their project so it's also um it's also if you're a student you get a discount on across some of these services that you might be integrated into an and, application you're creating and am i reading this wrong or is if the request a discount is actually you get it for free if you're a student you get the, you get those things for free as a student yeah okay. which are like some in some cases discounts and well look, there's uh uh yeah yeah and like yeah yeah basically so, yeah, pretty cool project. It is nice. And so it kind of fits in with adam.io, which is also kind of cool. And so you go to education.github.com for information on that. Hey, uh, Noah, you know what else is going on? A meetup? <laughs> yeah, because LinuxCon is happening in like just, well, tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not up fast. <laughs> Anyway, so LinuxCon, uh, August 17th through the 19th, and we're going to be there the 17th and the 18th at Seattle, the Sheraton, and uh, we're going to do a meetup. We're going to do a meetup while we're there Tuesday. Uh, they're doing an open source t-shirt contest, and so just a little bit before that, our meetup's going down. So go to meetup.com slash Broadcasting to eat, drink, and chat with us. We're going to hang out at the Tap House Grill. Uh, that's at uh, 1506 6th Avenue in Seattle. And uh, we're going to hang out there. About, we're going to meet up at 5 o'clock. And then for those of you who want to join us, we'll go back to uh, LinuxCon and uh, go to the open source t-shirt contest. This open source t-shirt con- contest is kind of cool 
Uh, they just say, uh, wear a T-shirt, and during the booth crawl, judges are going to come around and look at different shirts. Attendees should gather in the uh, ballroom at 7 p.m., where judges will make their final decision for the best vintage open-source T-shirt, funniest open-source T-shirt, and most creative open-source T-shirt. And our very own Angela Fisher will be one of the judges, so you may have an in. Anyways, uh, if you want to do that, you can go back and uh, join us for that. The booth crawl is always fun as well. So we're going to hang out at uh, the uh, Tap House Grill. Tuesday, August 18th, 5 p.m., meetup.com slash Broadcasting to find that, and then we'll go back to LinuxCon after that. And, of course, we're going to be at LinuxCon Monday and Tuesday, so you can just come up and say hi. We're going to be walking around. We're not going to have a booth. We're just going to be walking the floor. That's going to be awesome. I, I actually prefer it that way, yeah. rather than being tethered. Yeah, I do, uh, too. To, to one particular I place. I don't other... know what that means we're going to do for Unplugged, because we're, we're going to try to do Unplugged live from down there. <laughs> so if you see two guys standing in the lobby yeah. holding, holding microphones, microphones and a mixer <laughs> and a laptop on one person's back, that would be us. <laughs> <laughs> Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you want to hear about how that train wreck went in person. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thanks uh, for the vote of confidence. We'd love to see you there. I think it's going to be a good event. And rumor has it uh, there may be somebody semi-famous who had something to do with the creation of Linux there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. At LinuxCon. At LinuxCon. Put Linux on by the Con. Linux Foundation. Huh. huh. Who would that be? Don't know. But if you huh. make it, you might get to find out. Maybe Chris Fisher. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you'd like to go. And please do go because um, we if we get more than a few people, we should probably let the restaurant know. And the only way we're going to know is if you RSVP. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It, she, and she, and it, it sounded when I talked to her on like, the phone like, like it wasn't a ginormous place. No, they want to know. But they, yeah. do have a, they do have a specific area set aside. But they want to know. So we got to let them know. Yeah. So meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting and RSVP if you think you might be going. All right, Noah. Let's do the news. It's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. No, why don't you go to last.ting.com. Last.ting.com will get you a discount off your first Ting device, or if you have a Ting-compatible device, and you probably do because they have a big GSM and CDMA network, they'll give you $25 in service credit, which paid for more than my first month. And uh, I got to tell you, there's a lot of great ways to use Ting because it's really mobile on your terms. There's no contract, no early termination fee, and you only pay for what you use. And when I say it's really on your terms, I mean you can use it in a lot of different ways. You can be uh, like a, a high a highfalutin Nexus 6 user, or a Samsung Galaxy Edge S6 user, Nexus 5 user with the latest lollipop on there, or... You can roll like a boss like Noah does with your Kyocera Dura XT, a phone that costs less than $50. Actually, you paid even less on eBay. I did. I actually, this is one of my favorite phones because what it does is it... Uh it, it is it, it, durable, it, dude. It is extremely durable. So if you've seen the Casio G, uh, G1, or I don't know what it is, but there's there's some sort of other durable phone that was kind of the, the initial standard for it, and I think that's kind of what they went after. But I bought mine for like 12 bucks off of eBay. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12, did you say $12? I think that's what it was, yeah. $12. It was, it was like 6 for shipping, so yeah, it was yeah, like yeah, yeah. total. But point is, it was under 20 bucks, and uh, I got it home, and I was actually, I was on my way out to lunch when it arrived, <laughs> and so I pulled it out of the envelope, and I'm like, oh, Ting doesn't take very long to activate. I open it up. I go into my Ting account, I type in the MSID, M-E-S-I-E-S-I, ABG, F-I-Y, C-Q, and then uh, I click on activate, and I, I actually activated it in my car on the way out to lunch. Well, nice. That's how fast it was. Nice. And then it was activated, and I actually, I, the way I have my SIP system set up, I actually added the phone number for this phone as a resource for this for my SIP system, so when you call my extension, it dials that number directly, Ooh. and I can put people on hold. I can transfer. I can do now, all that stuff. This thing right from that plane. This old thing old. is uh, this is built back in the good old days where you you know you wanted these feature phones for like the construction workers. This yeah, is a right. super durable phone. Yeah. But the other thing these phones have because the job sites can be so freaking loud is these things have like this giant speaker on the front of them. Oh, so the ringer you, is incredible. You were saying it was in my Jeep, and I was outside working uh, on my lawn. And I heard the phone ring, and I'm like, no way. <laughs> and I went back in, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> and then the other thing that is amazing about it is because it's built, like you said, for construction workers, for people that are on the job, quote, quote unquote, it has a caddy. I haven't had a phone with a caddy since my Motorola StarTac. Oh, and cool. I love it. I love it. It has a little belt clip thing that it clips in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm an IT guy, so yeah. I strap everything that to my works. belt like Batman. Yeah. And uh, so Thanks now Batman. now I have my, my personal phone and I have my work phone. And and the great thing is, like, I shut my um, my personal phone off for at night. For $12, because, it's not a big deal. And remember, right. it's only six dollars for the ting line and then it's just your usage and my friends just can't keep track of my sleep schedule or apparently my last schedule so they just call at random time so i have to keep my phone off all the time yeah now i have the ability to say listen we have an emergency line yeah and so i just leave the emergency line active on that on my sip system yeah. and so as long as i leave the ringer on that phone on now i have 
Now and I what's nice about making this your emergency phone is uh, 100 hours of standby time. That's days of standby time. This thing has days of standby time. Yeah, we haven't. It, it's it, it at least has a day and a half because I've had it for a day and a half and it had a full battery when I left. Yeah. Actually, you know what? We'll see when we, I get back because it would actually yeah. have minimal use because it's just been sitting <laughs> in my Jeep. Well, so we'll see when I get back if it's still charged. I'll telegram you. So you can get it uh, right from Ting uh, for uh, forty-seven bucks uh, with our last.ting.com discount, or go find it on eBay for like twelve bucks and get it over. And on they're Ting. they're super cool with you buying phones. In fact, they'll help you yeah. look through other sites yeah. to find. You phones can call them at one eight five five Ting FTW. They have no whole customer service. You call them eight, between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. East Coast time, and they'll just work with you. They're, they're cool about that kind of thing. And, of course, they have all the, all the good phones. And, you know, anything that pretty much takes GSM that's compatible with their frequencies. Yeah, that's, 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 that's my new sin. Yeah. So this is why I have 10 devices active on my You thing. have 10 Ting devices? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just look. There's, there's 10. And then I have 8 inactive. Uh, but, yeah. That's another nice thing. The Ting dashboard lets you just turn stuff off so you don't have yeah. to pay for it. Yeah. You... And, you know, what my latest thing is, huh. is uh, I've started to, my son has gotten carried away. We got him a phone because it's $6 a month. Why not? And uh, and he started to do th- call people at times that I don't want him calling. Oh, I can actually suspend his device. I, we keep his number. But I can I can turn his service off just from the dashboard. Yes. So I can flip it off yeah. and say, okay, now you yeah. don't have service. Or for you can bit. do it also. You, you should get the Ting app. I, do, oh, you got I it. I totally have the Ting you app on my phone. You can do it from your phone too, which yeah. is pretty cool. Uh, all right, go to last.ting.com to support the show. Uh, and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. You guys are rocking. All right, so uh, let's talk about these Chromebook sales because they're cray. And remember, um, our friends over at Google base Chrome OS. Off of Linux, so in a way, these are Linux sales. Chromebooks are outselling Windows laptops for this last quarter. According to NPD, Chromebook sales through the U.S. business-to-business channels increased 43% during the first half of 2015. And actually, not just NPD, another organization is also confirming these numbers. Now, these are business-to-business sales, and I'll tell tell you why I think that's actually a a big deal in a moment. But first, also, get this, iPads dropped nearly 20%, and Android tablets dropped 8%. However, Windows tablets like the Surface in particular grew 35% over the year prior. Now, that's not too hard, though, because the Surface, had a, the Surface doesn't have a lot of numbers to begin with. For example, Microsoft sold a million Surfaces in Microsoft's second quarter, a million in the second quarter of 2015, and uh, Apple sold 21.5 million in the same quarter. So... Microsoft's about 20 million short. So they have some room to go up and down, and Apple has some room to go down there. But... These Chromebook sales, no, this is maybe uh, this is maybe starting to get into like serious territory here. Uh, I was I was looking at some of these numbers here, and uh, for businesses, this appears to be a pretty big deal. In fact, some other market uh, analysts are, are saying it was a fifty percent market share increase. Can you believe that? We just did a rollout, to, so we're a we're a provider for Choice Hotels, <clears throat> and so they oh, okay. just they 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 just rebranded a hotel as a roadway, and so we were brought in to, to do the IT infrastructure. Um, there are two browsers that Choice Hotel supports. One is uh, Internet Explorer, and the other one is Chrome. I will tell you, I we have never once and never will use Internet Explorer. That leaves me with Chrome, and we have used traditionally Linux systems <clears throat> because they just work, and I don't have to worry about all the virus and the malware and all that stuff. And of course, the GMs are really happy that we can provide all these workstations at a nominal cost that included Office Suite and all that other stuff. Now. Chrome OS devices would actually be perfectly well suited because a lot of those a lot of businesses are moving towards Google Docs anyway, and a lot and and I guess what I'm saying is they, are they they're really cor- yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah very much so very much okay. so very okay. much so in fact we had we had uh, we had there's a hotel chain. 26 hotels, and they went from off. They went from Microsoft Office to Office 365, and then Office 365 to Google Docs. And really, yeah. And basically, what that looked like was <clears throat> they had all this incompatibility trying to use different versions of Office. So they went to 365, and then finally somebody said, you know, basically we're doing a couple spreadsheets, a couple Word documents. We don't do any presentations. Hmm. Why are we paying ninety nine dollars a year yeah. for fifty workstations when all we have to when all the, the mean, stuff is very simplistic? The math make, makes sense. So then they just killed it. And and I'll wow. be honest. And I'll be honest with you. Are the people that work there are they happy about it not really oh really no they're not very happy about it and um, they they were used to microsoft office they like microsoft office and they were they were they were comfortable in their workflow but are they still getting their work done yeah 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 um but but so uh, the core uh, infrastructure is moving web-based do core th- infrastructure is doing that hmm. okay so here i have another theory so your theory is the chromebooks are enough uh, and I don't know, because you know, let's be, maybe to give us a little more context. Next story, kind of in this, is also Dell 
and Google together just announced that they're launching a Dell Chromebook 13 for the business market. This is a professional Dell laptop mm-hmm. for the Chrome. This is a Chrome laptop for the business market because Dell's obviously seeing this huge increase. Mm-hmm. And so there's a couple of uh, couple of thoughts. Why would Dell? Why would Dell want to do this? Why would Dell want to jump into the business Chromebook market? Uh, and so if you look at Google, Google saw a rise to the number one spot in market share in January to July. Now, something to kind of keep in mind here, and I think this is fascinating, because this lead up in sales, this increase in sales, this happened when the hype and build up to Windows 10 was at its highest. Mm -hmm. Like the Windows 10 is coming, Windows 10 is coming. Mm -hmm. This was at its highest peak during this period when when these sales were at their highest. So Windows 10 had no impact on these business-to-business channels. It wasn't available during that period, so of course they couldn't buy it, but they didn't hold their purchases up either, which we've seen in previous years. It doesn't appear that uh, the channels really cared about Windows 10 at all mm-hmm. when it came to business use. Now, there's a couple ways to look at that. Does that mean that Chromebooks are replacing Windows machines? I don't know if I agree. I think, so you're, that's your contention. I think more like what it is, is I think... These are sort of like accessories to the computers because people's desktops, if you've replaced them in the last three years, mm-hmm. are, are really good enough. I mean, to do what they need, to do, to do Google Docs mm-hmm. and to do like whatever their proprietary application is, they probably still use Outlook or mm-hmm. something like – to do that stuff, you don't need a 4 gigahertz i7 rig. You don't, you don't need mm-hmm. you know, all, this, all, this, all this hardware. And so uh, I think what they've decided is instead of replacing the staff's workstations, mm-hmm. let's make them more mobile for their meetings. Let's let them go home and work on Google Docs, mm-hmm. which is on the cloud. They don't have local storage, and they solve that security issue of, of local files. Mm-hmm. And so for them, it's like it's a great accessory, but it doesn't replace their main workhorse workstation. I uh, think it's like instead of tablets, it's Chromebooks now because they got physical mm-hmm. keyboards. They don't have local data. It's a lot safer in that regard. Yeah, I think you're hitting on some things. I think the <clears throat> I think the keyboard's a big part of it. I think the more mobile is a big part of it. In fact, we just we just that the business I was telling you about that we did last Tuesday, uh, they don't have any desktops. It's all laptops. <clears throat> but I think that you're I, I I that's not what I'm seeing. Businesses for the most part have swapped out their desktops every two years, and that's if they're not leasing. If they're leasing, a lot of times they're mm. replacing them every year. They're getting new machines. Really, you're seeing yeah. that high of a turnover. So, oh yeah, and if they're buying them, it's usually two at most five years. I've never uh, witnessed that high of a turnover. Really? Unfortunately, my my. My experience has been much slower. I would say five years if they have any kind of regular schedule. Yeah. And a lot of places, it's it's break and replace as needed. Yeah. Yeah, the, some of the smaller venues will do that. if They, they buy it and then it, when it breaks. But I- any any large-scale deployment has been yeah. – they, they have a schedule. And I'm, most I'm, of the time – You're that's, talking that's more than 200 years. employees, more than 200 seats kind yeah. of. Yeah, right. Um, and so and so if, if you look at it through that lens – and, and yeah, I think there has been a huge shift towards tablets and people have found ways. I have watched people shoehorn tablets into things that just blow my mind. And if they can get it done with a tablet, you can really get it done with a Chromebook. Because like you said, now I have a mouse and I have a keyboard. And in fact, I have started paying attention to this trend. People have started, if they, if they are using an iPad, it's not, they're not using the iPad function of it anymore. They pair it with a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse. Mm-hmm. Or, maybe it's not a mouse. Excuse, I, I could be wrong on I that. I think that's but, why Surface sales are up as well. <laughs> Yeah, and and to some degree, I see that the Surface to me is another fail because I don't get the touch advantages that I have with iOS or Android, and I still have the floppy device. But people like that, that physical that, keyboard. I, now, here's what the Dell. Here's what the Dell. This is why I think they, they like the Chromebook has a better. A Dell Chromebook could have a good build quality. And here's what they're doing: is they're introducing. They're also shipping it with SonicWall and Wise V Workspace system manageability. Mm-hmm. So these these Dell Chromebooks are going to have like a central control panel where you can manage some of the settings on these God, Chromebooks. That's cool. Yeah. So it's going to be more than just a regular Chromebook. So there's going to be some oversight by the IT uh, departments. Anyways, so I called it GUIX in the uh, intro because, you know, I don't know how to call it, pronounce anything. No, of course not. But uh, this is actually called Geeks, I guess. It's a it's Geeks SD is an advanced distribution of the GNU operating system developed by the GNU project, which respects users' freedoms. It's dependable and it's hackable. Uh, so I guess uh, I don't really know and know much about this particular distro, but it has what they call a functional package management manager. Um, and there's a video on their website if you're kind of curious about that. It's not uh, it's not a looker. 
It's, so it's not about that, but it offers transactional package updates, which uh, it, you know, you know, as you guys probably know, is kind of the big deal. They say it's dependable. That also makes it. That also sounds extremely interesting. But Noah, did, how did you come across this? Uh, it was. Uh, it was. I found it the subreddit actually. I was and, wondering. And what stood out to me is it, it looks like, you know, I, I agree with you that the um, the actual screen caps. Uh, yeah, but aren't, that's aren't what particularly it is. aren't particularly uh, not a big GY appealing, but not a big it deal. is. It, it does look like some serious. Uh, it does look like some serious effort is behind uh, creating what a I'm hoping freedom is, respecting distro. And I don't know if that's. I was wondering if this is why you grabbed it because what I was hoping is Noah is, you know, Triscoll's nice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, this is maybe this could be like this could be something really new and different that mm-hmm. is you know that's also. Blessed by the Free Software Foundation, potentially. I mean, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, anyways, here's what they say about the term functional. The term functional is specific to the package management discipline. In Geeks, the package build and installation process is seen as a function in the mathematical sense. The function takes inputs such as build scripts, a compiler, and libraries and returns an installed package. As a pure function, its result depends solely on its inputs. So, for instance, it cannot refer to software or scripts that were not explicitly passed as inputs. A build function always produces the same results when passed a given set of inputs. It cannot alter the system's environment in any way. For instance, it cannot create, modify, or delete files outside of its build and installation directories. That's achieved by running the build process in an isolated environment or containers when only their explicit inputs are visible, where only explicit inputs are visible. The result of the package build function is cached in the file system in a special directory called the store. Each package is installed in a directory of its own in the store by default under slash GNU slash store. The directory name contains a hash of all inputs used to build that package. Thus, changing the input yields a different directory name. This approach is the foundation of Geek's salient features, support for transactional package upgrades and rollback, Per user installation of packages, that's kind of neat, mm-hmm. uh, and garbage collection of packages. So this is kind of a neat thing here. It has a command line uh, UI to manage all of it, and also has a scheme programming interface. So that's Geeks, and it's not uh, it is not a production ready thing yet. It is it is for it is for Geeks to be using right now to test and provide them feedback. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it's a really cool distro, and it deserves some attention. GNU.org slash software slash guix if you want to check it out. And uh, it is, uh, they've also got a video on that uh, that functional package management, if what I just said sounded kind of crazy to you. And of course, you could install anything you want in theme and make it look any way you want. So yeah, sure, the default themes are a little, they make it look like the window decorator in GNOME is broken, but (laughs) you can fix that pretty quickly, really. That's not much to complain about. So that's called Geeks. Hey, speaking of GNOME, happy birthday. On Saturday, GNOME turned 18 years old. How about that, Noah? 18 years old, and I went and grabbed a couple of interesting bits about it. Um... Because, you know, when these kind of things happen, it's kind of fun to go back and, like, find the original uh, announcement. Mm-hmm. So I went back and found the original announcement by Miguel de Casa. And uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot you could pull out of this. I just thought I'd go get the most flame-baity thing to pull out. No, I'm kidding. Um, I thought I'd go get something that was kind of interesting. They talk about KDE. And, you know, one of the big complaints whenever you launch an open-source project is duplicating effort. Yeah. That's right. all. Come on, you're duplicating yeah, effort. Yeah. So they go in here, they're talking about what their goals are and some common questions regarding uh, the new project. And so the first common question in this list why don't you just use or contribute to KDE? <laughs> this is, uh, okay, so what date was this? Uh, this was a Friday, August 15th, 1997. That was a while back. 2219 in the evening. 2219, so that's 10, 19? Uh, he says here, uh, why don't you just use and contribute to KDE? Miguel says, KDE is a nice project, and they have good hackers working on it, and they have done a very good job. Unfortunately, they've selected the non-free QT toolkit as the foundation for this project, which poses legal problems for those designing to redistribute the software. That was a big deal back in the day. Yeah. Not such a big deal anymore. been resolved. Um, why not just write a free QT replacement instead? The KDE project in its current form has about 89,000 lines of code. However, the Qt library has 91,000 lines of code. He also talks about having to use different Qt things. But then the other common question, are you crazy? Are you going to rewrite everything from scratch here? And I don't know if this actually ever happened, but here's what he said. No. 
We will try to reuse existing code from GNU programs as much as possible while adhering to the guidelines of the project. Putting nice and consistent user interfaces over all time favorites will be one of the projects. I don't really know how much they really did that. It's putting interfaces over all time favorites. Mm-hmm. And then he says, we plan on reusing code from KDE as well. You think that? Maybe they did at one point, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Oh, no, yeah, they're very different. It's funny to look back, though, and uh, to look back at the launch of the, uh, GNOME, the GNOME software project. I remember back in the early project. days of, of, of my Linux experience, and the guy told me, he said, if you want, if you want, the, if you want the, the easy desktop to use, then you use KDE, and if you want the more advanced desktop, you use GNOME. And that's how I got started with GNOME. <laughs> really? Right or wrong? I'm not saying it was the right, more advanced desktop? I'm not, I'm not saying it was right or wrong. <laughs> not, it, you know, don't, don't hate on me, but the, when I first started with Linux, I, that's what I was told. I, and I, start, I was like, I want to be advanced. I'll use GNOME. Now, this is so many years ago. I could have this wrong, but I seem to remember one of the things that impressed me about GNOME before KDE had it, now of KDE rocks this in spades, is GNOME had applets. And I could put my oh, CPU yeah. monitor in the menu bar, yeah. and I don't think you could do that at the time with KDE. Yeah. And they got around to it, obviously, and now they have plasma widgets and things like that. But uh, that was one of the reasons I wanted to use GNOME, is I wanted my CPU meter up in because that <laughs> yeah. was cool. Yeah. Also, X-Eyes. Watching my cursor. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. Just a quick story to wrap up the news segment, because I think this is a huge deal. And uh, I know uh, our friends over at Valve are super excited about it. Noah, you're probably super excited about it. Uh, Google announced that they're going to support Vulkan, the graphics API, the low overhead rendering uh, graphics API on Android. Uh, in order to address some of the sources of CPU overhead and provide developers with some explicit control over rendering, we've been working to bring new, the new 3D rendering API Vulkan to Android. Like OpenGL ES, Vulkan is an open standard for 3D graphics and rendering maintained by Kronos. Vulkan is being designed from the ground up to minimize CPU overhead in the driver and allows your application to control GPU operations more directly. Vulkan also enables better parallelization by allowing multiple threads to perform work such as command buffer construction at once. In other words, the same graphics API that Valve really wants for SteamOS Mm -hmm. that's already being worked on by NVIDIA and ATI Mm -hmm. under Linux Mm -hmm. is also now going to be available on Android. And this is a huge deal because the future of OpenGL is a little rocky. It's getting, you know, it's like 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of developers want it out of here. Uh, Some prominent developers at Valve have blogged about this. And the the kind of takeaway I've gotten is Vulkan is really good at sort of addressing the problem we face today. And that that problem would be a lot of different devices, everything from like these power VR GPUs in, in like your Nexus phone there up to the NVIDIA 9700 in the servo workstation, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got to be able to write to all of that. And so that's what, that's sort of the main current market demand need. And of course, you're talking everything up to super clusters as well for like, you know, massive compute. And, uh, and so Vulkan is is sort of addressing uh, the needs uh, that DirectX and Apple's Metal solve. DirectX, you know, the dominance that DirectX has had for so long now may finally, finally be challenged by something like Vulkan. Mm -hmm. We may actually, now DirectX is a complete, is a little more complete. It also has an audio API and and, and, and a few other things. But the, the, the core thing, the graphics aspect of it, we may have a real, true, genuine competitor backed by the Kronos Group. I'm excited. I don't know. It's all early days yet, but things are picking up really well. And I'm just really happy to see that the first class future uh, graphics API for Linux is also going to be available on Android. And one of the things that I've learned through Coda Radio and e- getting email in from Android developers, mm-hmm. and I've just gotten a handful of these, and what they've told me, Noah, is... I became a better Linux. I actually, what I've gotten is I, I was able to port this game. I was able to port this application to Linux because I created an Android version. And when, when you create native Android apps, mm-hmm. like games and stuff, mm-hmm. I guess you end up do kind of playing around that on like, like the Linux level. Yeah. And you kind of learn that kind of stuff. And you, sure. And so uh, they're able to take those skills and apply them to importing their applications over to Linux. And so more developers writing on Android means more developers eventually to write for Linux, potentially, you know, a percentage of them. Yeah. And the fact that the graphic APIs will be common means that a huge bulk of their work mm-hmm. is done for them. And uh, I just think this is, I think I, for as much crap as I often give Google about their privacy stuff and how they're taking stuff from ASOP and abandoning it and, and making these play editions, this is a big move. And it's huge for gaming on Linux, and I'm, I'm really excited. So we'll just follow it. It's early days. Nothing's going to happen for a while out. But mark your calendars, folks. August 16th, 2015, episode 378 of the Linux Action Show was when this went down. It really won't matter for a year or two from now. But in a year or two from now, when everything is in Vulkan, when I open GL is a memory, mm-hmm. we'll look back at it and understand this was the moment that really kicked it into high gear and tipped the scales, I think. I think this just tipped the scales. So I think it's a big deal. Yeah. 
I'm happy with anything that gets more people to use Linux. And obviously, if we had the <laughs> – God, the, the mere thought of having the application infrastructure of Android available to me on Linux No, I'm not be, saying that's going to well, happen. No, I'm just saying the, 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 the possibility – of, yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's going to get more people familiar with yeah. writing applications for Linux and games for Linux, and I think that's a really good thing. That's that's what I mean. But uh, I, you know, I'm gonna now now I feel like it's worth also kind of learning more about Vulkan and investing in it because it's it's. I think at this point it's going somewhere. Yeah. Well, useful. I thought it was going to, but I mean now it's going. It's going to go big because there's a lot of set top boxes built off Android. Steam OS is going to use Vulkan. Like, I think it's going to be a really big deal, and all of it's going to. I mean, it's gonna, there's going to be so many ancillary benefits for desktop Linux that uh, I'm just really excited about that. All right, Noah. That's all the news for this week. Like a little fairy from computer heaven right before an event, we often get a System76 rig to review, and we're just about to go off to LinuxCon, and we needed something powerful to run some of the media production. So System76 sent us over the Serval Workstation Killer to review. It's called the Serval WS, and I think that probably stands for Workstation, Noah, don't you? I would say that's a fairly accurate uh, estimate. So here's how they label it. The fastest Ubuntu laptop on the planet. You can get it with uh, GeForce 970s. You can get it with Quadro GPUs. It has a PCI Express SSD option. 15-inch or 17-inch display, 1080p matte display, by the way, 1080p matte display if you want, up to 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's what this machine is in a nutshell. It is meant to be a workstation on the go. Uh, and I would say uh, a lot of things in our review will reflect that aspect. The weight, it's significant. The it's, power supply. The power supply is also significant. Um, just to kind of give you uh, a little bit of an idea about that. Uh, uh, the the weight of this thing, depending on how it is specced, is something that uh, you probably want to look into. Uh, it depends on the model, but the largest one, the 17 inch, can weight can clock in at 8.6 pounds. So it's it's just something to, be, to know about. Uh, it uh, so let's talk about this though, Noah. This when we pulled it out of the box, uh, I was I, I I'm you, you were and impressed. I, you and I are coming at it from so far yes. different ends of yes. the spectrum. It, yes. it's unbelievable yes. because I'm looking at it from like somebody who's owned a bonobo now for going on three plus years. Yep. And you're looking at it as somebody who pretty much won't use anything larger than a 13-inch laptop. He, he, here's what happened. He pulls it out of the box and, like, almost simultaneously goes, wow, this thing is really slim and small. And I go, wow, that thing is huge and obtuse. <laughs> Why yeah. did you carry that? And he goes, I can't. This is so much smaller than Bonobo. This is amazing. That is so much bigger than anything I yeah, would even yeah. consider working on. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there, so it depends, you know, where you're coming from. Uh, it's either a huge laptop or a slightly slimmer, trimmer version of what desktop killers were in the past. So, uh, what did you think of the build of it? The build was impressive. Um, the it is a really, really solid computer, and, and it's a computer that I I feel like I would have no problem uh, taking in some rougher environments. Like if you if you told me, hey, no, you know what? I think this is going to be the laptop I'm going to take with me on the road. I wouldn't yeah, worry about totally, it. Right? Now, I would be worried about something if you were going to use like the Galago. I actually snapped the screen on my Galago. Yeah, it's um, some, that's more of a that's more of a, yeah, but like a travel companion laptop, commuter right. laptop. Yes. this is. This is, you could legitimately do high-end production work on this, yeah. or CAD work, or whatever is, requires a lot of GPU or CPU. It's folding your desktop up and taking it with you. Yeah, and so, to, and to that end, too, I think, and you know, you and I are kind of in a good position to actually make this review, because we have looked at pretty much every System76 laptop ever. Yeah. We've owned several of them for, right. for going on seven, eight years now. Um, and I got to say, out of all of them, with maybe the Ultra Pro, maybe with the exception of the Ultra Pro, Noah. Mm hmm I think this has the best screen. This screen is really yeah, sharp. Yeah, it was really sharp. And that was the, the first that was the first thing that stood out to you when you turned it on. Mm -hmm. Was you said, "Man, that's a good-looking yeah. screen." Now, my Bonobo's 3 years old, so I'm looking at a 3-year-old display now. Mm -hmm. But I I like um I don't see any edge lighting. Like, mm -hmm. and you're looking at it from the edge right now. Yeah, no, it looks great. And the Rakai said the same thing when he, was, he Rakai was sitting literally 90 degrees from where you were using it. And he could see what you were doing yeah. on the computer and yeah. said it looked sharp and crisp. And this is the 1080p resolution, and I have to be honest with you folks. Right now, I, I wish I could say get the 4K, get a high K display. I think under Linux right now, uh, 2K and, and 1080p are the sweet spot for resolution. I don't mm -hmm. think everything's high DPI ready yet. Uh, so th that that those elements of it are, are really kind of fantastic. And while we're talking about uh, display, this thing has two display port and an HDMI out. Mm -hmm. So you could you could drive three external monitors and rock the internal screen. Right. Yeah, I was going to say so you have four you have, you have the ability to command four different displays mm -hmm. from a laptop, man. Mm -hmm. And from a production standpoint, <clears throat> the fact that it's 1080p is ideal. The fact that you can send out to to your to your transmission machine, and you could have say a spare screen to have Windows stored up, yeah. show notes, whatever, yeah. and you could still have the oh, actual yeah. laptop it's, to use. 
That's it incredible. really would be a good road trip machine. Yeah. Uh, so here's the unit as we got it. Here's the specs. It has a core i7 with a max clock frequency of 4 gigahertz, uh, which we've reached a few times. Well, it's pretty, mm. that's where we're at right now. 16 gigabytes of RAM. I was a little. It's a little low end on the RAM. 500 gigabyte spinning Rust disk, 1080p display, two display ports, one HDMI out, backlit keyboard, multi display, hardware controlled, so that way you don't have to have any software installed to do that. Works across all distributions. Obviously, because this is a big rig, it has a dedicated 10 key number pad. I love that. It's using Intel 72. 65 wireless AC, and I I think this is their best keyboard ever. It has the concave yeah. keys, like uh, uh, similar to the how the new ThinkPads are, but slightly different. Yeah, they're not the clicklet style though. It's an actual <laughs> right. full keyboard, which is nice. Right. It's not I know a lot of people really like that. Yeah, it's not the islands. It's a it's a regular, more traditional style keyboard, but still with a bit of concave. And their best travel in a while too. It's a really, really good feeling keyboard. Everything's printed on there, including the uh, super key has the Ubuntu logo printed on that yeah, glows which, through. Yeah, exactly, glows through, which is what, one of the things that I noticed right off the bat. Yeah, that's nice. And I like. And I, I, I typing on this this morning. I'm the show, um, and then coming back and working on my Bonobo a little bit, the Bonobo, I think, I think really had a pretty good keyboard. Uh-huh. That was one of the really nice things about the Bonobos. This is definitely a step up from that even, because it's sort of like everything we've learned about laptop keyboards now kind of brought up to this. Yeah. Um, the and, and so that's where System76 had kind of, there's a bit of a, a quandary they found themselves in. And I, I know this is maybe your main complaint uh, with just sort of the overall look of the machine is one of the things that's a little funky about it is they had to decide where to put that trackpad. Should yes. it be lined up with the screen and the power button, or should it be lined up with the keyboard? When you have a big, when you have a big laptop with a big keyboard and a ten key, yeah, they opted to off center the trackpad, and that's just driving you crazy. It's driving me nuts, and <coughs> for a couple of reasons, I understand why they did it because you are supposed to sit off centered from the laptop, and the ten key is supposed to hang out to the side. The reality right. is, then my screen is off centered from my vision, and I don't like that. And I consistently hit the right key. You asked me why I went back to my ThinkPad when I was writing show notes. Because I kept hitting the the right click, yeah. and I, I'm, it's it is a it is a training issue. If you used it, I'm sure if I used it for even yeah. a week, I wouldn't even notice so it anymore. I'm looking at my bonobo, but right now it's driving me nuts. So, I'm, I'm cracking up, I'm cracking out the old bonobos, and the bonobos they centered it more, right? It's more yeah. centered. There. It's Don't, still off though. It's well, still look where it's the still, space bar is. Yeah, but it's not as dramatic, and I think that's a nice yeah. compromise on the bonobo style. Is it's a little more. So I think I like that better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but boy, the bonobo is a big machine. Look at that thing compared to this. Uh, that is so. Then there's one other thing. So we talked about the video. This one has the uh, the uh, GTX uh, 970M in it, okay? And the 970M is a pretty pretty impressive chip. And so we wanted to throw a couple of different workloads at it. But one of the other things this Bonobo includes is uh, this one also includes NVIDIA G-Sync. And NVIDIA G-Sync is NVIDIA's attempt to try to solve screen tearing in your video games. And with uh, NVIDIA Kernel 3. Dot, uh, I'm sorry, NVIDIA Kernel 340.24. With NVIDIA Kernel 340.24, they introduced G-Sync support for Linux. And what G-Sync essentially does, and I'm sorry, this is my layman's description of it, but what G-Sync essentially does is it synchronizes the render speed of your GPU with the refresh rate of your monitor. So that way the GPU is delivering results at the same time the monitor is drawing the results. Because otherwise, the monitor runs at a, at a, at a, like at a consistent 60 hertz refresh rate. Mm-hmm. But the GPU, depending on the workload, has a variable delivery rate of data. Right. And so sometimes, like when you're panning in a 3D shooter and, it, it, and you see tearing, yeah. it's because the GPU and the, and, the, and, the re, and the refresh of the monitor are out of sync. So G-Sync brings those two things into sync together. It requires functionality in the monitor and it requires functionality in the GPU. It requir- requires functionality in the driver. NVIDIA has introduced that starting with NVIDIA 340.24 Linux kernel. Or, I'm sorry, Linux NVIDIA driver. And so you can now get tear-free gaming under Linux if the game supports it. So it's kind of a nice thing to have NVIDIA G-Sync in a portable workstation like this because you get really top, top, top-end gaming. And you can go buy an external display that supports G-Sync as well, and you could drive a couple of them. So that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, okay, so Sean says it's the other way around. The monitor refresh syncs to the GPU, which I, I might have said that backwards. But, yeah, that. so the monitor refresh is able to sync to the GPU because the GPU is able to communicate to the monitor using G-Sync. Kind of neat. Yeah, <clears throat> very much so. And it has other applications outside of just gaming as well. The, the comparison you're showing is... is uh, Not that. Oh, okay, that's something different. That's, that's, the, uh, that's just this rendering of the MacBook versus that. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about our benchmarks. We ran some benchmarks. We, uh, since we, uh, we, had, uh, we had a little extra time doing the audio version of the show, we were actually able to throw some real-world benchmarks at it. <clears throat> and one of the things I thought would be interesting, 
to our audience is what can the CPU do? Like if you wanted to throw, say, an encryption task at it, you wanted to encrypt with GNU, G, uh, GNU PG a one gigabyte file. Well, uh, this System76 serval workstation was able to crack out a one gigabyte uh, GNU PG file in 7.31 seconds. Mm-hmm. That is actually not bad. The Bonobo was clocking in at like 13 seconds. That's a pretty huge reduction. Let's stop there for a second, and let me just ask you. If you were specking this machine out, would you have chosen to go with the spinning disk? No. No, I was thinking I would get to the cons, and I was. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, because I think I want to talk about that specifically. Because I think when you're getting to this class of machine, it matters more than ever. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I just yeah. didn't know if that would affect well, some of Well, it might. It might, but the Bonobo has SSD drives and still was slower. The Bonobo oh, okay. has two SSD drives and was still slower. Yeah. Right? So that, I think that's more of a CPU band thing, possibly, okay. but I'm not sure. Um, and then let's clock in here. Let's look at, uh, check this out. Again, these are going to be more CPU related, but disk I.O. is going to play a role in here. So it's worth pointing that out. Because, yeah, it will have a, it does, it does have a factor, right? Uh, uh, Apache compilation time. We're able to, co we're able to build Apache 247 in 26 seconds. Linux kernel 3.18 was built in 98 seconds. It's not bad. <clears throat> The uh, M player suite, 40 seconds, and PHP was built in 25 seconds. So just to kind of give you, if you can, now the reason I'm giving you these numbers, and we have all of these included in the show notes, uh, is if you have a machine today, you could download the Pharonix test suite, and run this actually a really good test suite, uh, and I really suggest you check it out. You could run these against your current machine and see how they compare same to, to our numbers and see what kind of performance improvement you'd be getting. So that's what I like about providing these hard numbers is these numbers by themselves are a bit arbitrary. Uh -huh. uh, okay, great. It, it takes 25 seconds to build PHP. But you could now go run that on your own machine using that same test suite right. and see what the delta would be mm -hmm. and get a good idea of what kind of performance improvements you get because I'm a pretty imp – the Linux kernel in 98 seconds is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. That's, this is what Torvalds needs to <laughs> – Yeah, right. Yeah, we should send him one of these. Yeah, <laughs> that's, good. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so those are out there, and uh, you can go grab those if you want. And uh, I think it's kind of – I think it was, uh, it was pretty nice. Um, and also, Noah, that from just like a, a raw gaming standpoint – I loaded a Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, which is like the latest triple A uh -huh. game to come to Linux, which is a bit of a hog. Mm -hmm. It is not super optimized, and I maxed it out, yeah. maxed out all the settings, and I was still getting uh, pretty good results. And then, of course, um, there's the classic. Uh, there's the uh, Heaven demo that yeah. uh, pushes the machine. This is um, this demo is set to absolute max. Now <clears throat> you can see a little tearing in our capture setup. That's not actually related to G-Sync. That's related to the fact that our Black Magic cards don't support G-Sync. Um, right now, I'm getting about 30 frames per second. Oh, right now, I'm getting 40 frames per second. 41 frames per second. That's pretty impressive, considering this is 8x anti-aliasing. Mm -hmm. This is every con considerable setting set to max anisotropic filtering. Uh, they have some. They have like a bedazzled. Uh, I don't even know what it does, but I turn that up to max. <laughs> I'm serious, man. So this is a GTX 970, currently running uh, with a uh, one gigahertz GPU and 2.5 gigabytes of RAM. And as I'm doing this, the uh, GPU is currently clocking in at 60 degrees Celsius. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so this, it's not even breaking a sweat. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, this is a, this machine. And you know what? The first time we ran this demo, mm -hmm. we were kind of we were kind of just like, just sort of setting everything up. And the mm -hmm. first time we ran this demo, I was installing the Phronix test suite and downloading all the packages, which is hundreds of packages. Yeah. And we were downloading Middle Earth from Steam in the background, which is like a 48 gigabyte download, and it was downloading at 10 megs a second. Sure. And we were installing software from the software center while we were playing this demo, and the machine then wasn't breaking a sweat either. Essentially, let's get into the cons now, because essentially the way it works is once, once you get off the disk, pretty much nothing, nothing chokes this machine. But at this day and age, when you have 4 gigahertz i7s, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, and you have a 970 GPU mm -hmm. to straddle this thing with a spinning disk yeah. is is yeah. terrible. Yeah, you, I, and, and I you just think that, and if you hit that limitation more than once in yeah. just a couple of days, you've had it. Yeah, I mean for production purposes, it's probably too slow because mm -hmm. the operating system just loading applications. I have forgotten how slow a spinning disk can be, and it's sort of like it's it's like you get this weird hot cold thing with this yeah. machine right. where it's insanely fast. Yeah, and it's like. 
you you said something earlier that was really point uh, really point on, and you said something to the effect of part of your problem when you're reviewing these computers is you bought in so heavily with the Bonobo years ago. What, what was it you said? No, I just said that you you bought uh, such a great computer so many years ago, and it is it was such an overspec machine at the time that it's still so relevant today. By any measurable standard, the Bonobo is still a very good, very 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 powerful machine. In fact, your Bonobo still wipes the floor with most every almost every laptop I have, yeah. if not every laptop I have, and so then to go to to this computer, you you are already over spec to begin with, and then to bring this computer in and try to compare it, it's like, well, we're having a hard time. You said, how can I really push this thing? Well, you're going to have a hard time really pushing it much harder than the Bonobo can do, because the Bonobo can still crunch everything that you've thrown yeah, at it. Yeah, I would say, though, uh, this is one of the first machines from a performance standpoint. Like, uh, there's a lot of machines we've reviewed where I've been like, oh, yeah, well, it's way lighter. Uh, mm -hmm. The battery is way better. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first machine where I'm like, I can feel this is faster than the Bonobo at a lot of things. Oh, you can. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in some ways, especially with the graphics. But then, but where the Bonobo continues to kick its ass is anytime I'm launching a couple of things at once or installing yeah. packages in the background, which is kind of how I roll. Yeah. Uh, the Bonobo's disk I/O is just so much better, right. and then that's that all. That's all that really and, matters. And I mean, honestly, I mean, so if uh, if and for some reason you're stuck on a spinning disk, once that stuff caches, you're probably okay. Um, but to get that stuff to cache inside of the disk is it, it I, is it's painful. You clicked. He was he he literally he clicked on Chrome, said. Didn't I turn to do something else on his other computer? Turn back and said, "Oh, didn't I launch Chrome?" And then said, "Oh, maybe I did launch Chrome." Alt tab through a couple different programs. Thought maybe he launched Firefox. Went to the terminal and then Chrome opened. I mean, that's how long it to took. To be fair, it was the first launch of Chrome. It was, yeah. and it was right after a reboot. But the point is, somebody who buys that computer out uh, out of the gate and then sees that it's uh, you know it's it's a problem. Or can be. And, yeah, and there's tricks, you know. There's you can do caching, but uh, I think I guess here's my con for this machine is. I can't really fully recommend it unless you're willing to spend the money on an SSD yep. option. And yeah. the and the and the fact of the matter is for this machine and I think it's I think it's maybe just worth it if you're somebody who's considering going this route is uh they do offer a I'm looking at the discs here. They do offer PCIe storage. Oh good. For $195 additional That's the way to go. for $195 you could go PCIe 256 gigabytes and dude 2.1 gigabyte read, yeah. 1.2 gigabyte write per second. I, at this point, I would M.2, uh, you know, tie it to the bus if you're going to, uh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You spend the extra money. So I would say if that, that and by the way, by the way, it supports an additional drive. So you could still, you could still, uh, you could still add additional storage if 256 isn't enough. Mm -hmm. So there's ways you could play with that too. Like you could get a spinning, you could get a spinning primary and then a, a PCIe secondary. So that's maybe one, one sort of knock I would give this machine though mm -hmm. is... SSD is an option. It doesn't ship with one by default. And mm -hmm. I think in, in 2015, um, the high-end workstation killer machines, now they still still offer the Bonobo. Mm -hmm. So this isn't like the top, 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 because the latest Bonobo is pretty extreme too. Mm -hmm. But in 2015, this class of machine, like if you're going up, like on their main spec page, they're comparing it to a MacBook Pro on rendering. Mm -hmm. Well, the MacBook Pro comes with a PCI. It's soldered in, but it's PCI storage. It's damn fast, so right? So I, I have a speculation about why that might be. And my speculation is that... Uh, the last big, the last powerful machine I worked on was actually like a thirty thousand dollars server, and what they were doing was they were doing chemical calculations. I was just going to say, that. and so when you come to something like yep. that, yep. disk I/O is, not, I mean, it's it's it's, it's important. important, it's not unimportant, right. but the reality is, is like storage is infinitely more por important. Yeah, I, I think than a big, I think size. You, yeah, is, I think a know. big part of it is this is some large workloads, huge files, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And so those, those, I mean, we're talking 20, 30 gigs per yeah. calculation that it was spitting out. And so in that respect, there's no way we could have done that with SSDs. It had to be spinning disks. And and if I, if I was using something like that in a mobile station or even video editing, Chris, if I was going to use yeah. that for video editing, I'd rather have 500 gigs storage of, of storage it, as mm. opposed to 128 gigs, yeah. gigs solid because yeah. I can I'm going to be able to edit the video and if I can't store the if I can't even store the video clips, yeah. then everything else is out the window. I think anyway. my recommendation would be if you're going for a machine like this, uh, you just un you have to, to unleash this potential. Put the operating system on an SSD, put your applications, and then get spinning disk for storage if you can. Because I think it makes a pretty big difference as far as performance of this overall uh, workstation goes. But uh, it's uh, it's quieter than the Bonobo. Uh, it's thinner than the Bonobo. It's lighter than the Bonobo. The power adapter is as big as the Bonobo's. Takes up less desk space than it does. the Bonobo? It does. Even though it's a 17-inch display, it still takes up less desk space. And actually, I'm kind of noticing the bezel, I think, is a little more attractive yeah, it uh, is. than the It also the has this cool ambient light underneath. And just like yeah. the Bonobo, it also has a has a subwoofer underneath. Yeah, and yeah. it makes a difference. Yeah, it makes it, a big difference. This very good speakers. Now, Rakai noticed something. Um, uh, we don't know exactly why this is, but Ubuntu 
isn't able to channel the subwoofer separately from the two speakers. I don't I don't think that subwoofer is split out like that. Yeah, I that think was my thought too. It just tied into the left channel probably. And it probably just gets the low signal. Yeah. 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 I think the same thing, but just but that if actually makes is, it simpler in a lot of ways. It does, and it's it's the way I would prefer because I'd rather not have I'd rather not have uh, all that stuff to monkey with in, in the in the control panel. But if apparently people that uh, that are looking for uh, for that three channel audio, they expect those controls. So if that's something that's important to you, all right. Um, Last but not least, in the con section, because I don't want to finish uh, uh, the uh, is the battery life. Um, you, you, that's a con for you. Huh? I don't think so, but I, I think you got to make this disclaimer because people look at these laptops and they have certain expectations. Uh -huh. This, the battery in this machine is your best case scenario when it's new and you're pushing it is two hours in my opinion. And I think that's way more than enough because it's enough for you to put the laptop into suspend, move it to its next location and then power it back up, which, and I think in a laptop like this, that's what you're doing with it. I think you're moving it from one fixed location to another. I don't think you're taking it. You might be going on a plane ride. Uh, but th I just, I do not think it's a laptop that's designed for people that are taking it with them everywhere and living on it like I do. Right. And, and I, and I guess, so there's a couple ways to look at the battery. The battery is long enough for me to get it, you know, around from like place A to, a to B and have it sleep the entire time and not lose any of my data. You know, that battery is going to last me a really long time. Um, it's a, it's an eight cell battery, I guess, looking at the specs on their website, mm -hmm. it's an eight cell battery. Uh, the one nice thing about the Bonobos power adapter, it's huge mm -hmm. and it charges the battery faster than any laptop I have yeah. ever used. Yeah. When we got it, we run it, we ran it down to 40% downstairs this mm -hmm. morning and I took it upstairs and I plugged it in and within, I, I, I don't know exactly, but within an hour, less than an hour, much less than full. an hour, 45 minutes or so, it was full again. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, so that's neat. Two hours, we're installing software during that. We're using it pretty heavily. Uh, so you just have to keep that. It's heavy-ish, depending on which one you get, eight to six pounds, and, you know, two hours of battery life. If you get the 15-inch screen, I'm sure the battery would last longer. Mm. It's obvious when they built this machine that battery life wasn't a priority. The battery takes right. up a small chunk underneath it. It's a tiny piece of the machine overall. To me, in a laptop like that, the battery is nothing more than a UPS. Yeah, it, well, it's a UPS, and it's it is a it is a great way to have a long standby period. You're gonna get yeah, like right, a day right, and, right. and change of standby, which is really nice, and that's really what you use it for. Yeah. I just want to make that disclaimer because yeah. if people pick this up, don't expect a lot of battery. If you're okay with two hours, and that might even decrease down an hour thirty as the machine gets older. Right. And See, I and, am. And, I am okay. And the, with that, the way but I, I look make at that, I think you got to make that disclaimer. Yeah. I think that you have to kind of consider that a con because they, there is a way they could have designed the bottom of this laptop to double the size of the battery. The problem is it's already so heavy. Yeah. That if you made a bigger battery, it's going to be you know it could be a ten pound laptop or a nine pound laptop. And so I think they made a good compromise. It's just. The only downside is, is it pretty much k takes away all portability. That said, you're looking at the jerk that ported that bonobo around to his clients for a while. Yeah, so. I mean, I guess I, to me, I, I see it as a benefit, and I say that because I think that to to strap. I told you when you pulled it out of the box, I guess that you'd get 30 to 45 minutes of battery with the with the size and the the weight of that battery, uh, with the power that you're drawing from it. The fact that they are able to squeeze two hours out of that, I think, is phenomenal, and I think it well well outperforms. Anything that you would need to do for somebody that's purchasing that laptop. I don't think, I, I, like I said, I, I see that laptop as, as a foldable desktop that's being moved from one location to the other. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it with that, then mm -hmm. the battery is, is totally... It's perfect. Yeah, and it yeah. overdoes what it needs to do. Did you have any other uh, kind of thoughts? And Yeah, the battery was the last one. Yeah. So oh, actually, no, I, I do. I take it back. The 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 I.O. or the, the, oh, the yeah, audio I.O. is amazing. Yeah. Uh, so the the ability you have the you have speakers yep. you have line out yeah. you have a headphone out yeah. and you have a microphone jack yeah and and, and the built-in I just mentioned them briefly already but the built-in speakers are phenomenal yeah we were playing Pandora we were playing games on them and it, they really sound really good I, I would go watch, as far as to say is that's the best sounding laptop I've yeah, ever heard I would too I would say that as well and I would say I would happily watch a, a HD movie on this thing yeah. it, with no problem mm -hmm. it sounds really good uh, so there's that also I wanted to mention it has eSATA in it as well which is kind of yeah. nice to have eSATA on the side USB 3 throughout several ports on one side and one port on the other side um, the uh, the my takeaway review of this is, I if I was on the market today, and I kind of almost am. If I was on the market today, I absolutely would go with this over the Bonobo for me personally right yeah. now. And I think this would be the perfect machine for production on the road with its with its multiple audio uh, options, its multiple inputs, eSATA for external storage to have long term storage of, of of large files for video editing and storage, multiple displays out to drive displays and have monitors, and the horsepower this thing has. 
it, and the fact that it has capacity for two drives. If mm-hmm. you have any kind of serious workload, this is to me, it's 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 an obvious machine. And the fact that it can also cut. I mean, the fact that I I ran that game, which that uh, Middle Earth Shadow of Mortar, which is known for being a pig at max settings, and was still. I mean, I was getting like I don't know. I don't know what the frame rate was, but it was totally playable. How's the noise? It's it's like um. It's like a different kind of frequency noise. It's there. Uh, here, I'll, uh, I can't really. Here, uh, you talk for a second. And I'll move my mic. So, I'll tell, uh, so, so tell him what I'm doing as I do this so okay, I don't make so, much noise. So, okay, so here's what he's going to do. He's going to take the microphone and re-pivot it down and point it right towards the center of the keyboard of the laptop. Uh, there you go. That's not very bad. So I don't even hear that. It doesn't sound any worse than just the ambient room. Yeah, it's not bad. Now we're not pushing it too bad, but we were running that uh, that you demo. Were, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so it's it's quieter than the bonobo. Now the bonobo has actually gotten a little louder as it's gotten older. That's one of the neat things about kind of owning these machines is now mm-hmm. I can do like a three year into it. Yeah, and some of these machines have gotten a little louder as time has gone on, but I don't think the bonobo was quite this quiet. You know what I do dig for some dumb reason. Hmm. Is this LED light strip they installed at the bottom that lights up the... Yeah, just don't, uh, when you're looking at it for the first time, don't turn it over on its back. Hold it right up to your face and push the power button because it's blinding. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, good I, to know. I don't though. know what the... Uh, I, know, I know that probably affects a lot of people. I, uh, everyone does that, I know. Yeah. What do you think the purpose of that? Is it just a uh, is it just a mood thing? Or? Yeah, well, and I think it doesn't it pulse, too, when it sleeps. And then they... Oh, by the way, you should also mention fingerprint reader. Yeah, the fingerprint reader. Didn't bother but, setting that up, but... Uh, and my I, tri- tri- I actually... I tried, and I couldn't get it to work. Oh. It, not, and I don't don't think it's anything wrong with the laptop. I, I think it's Noah's stupidity in being able to set it. I went to user accounts because I thought that's where oh, I would yeah, enroll yeah, my fingerprint. Yeah, no, um, and I didn't see it in there. No, there's like a there's like a it's a separate thing that gets set up. Um, so you know you can still you can still they still have the system seventy six tool that uh, lets you check to see if uh, everything is uh, good and legit. And uh, by the way, the tool says for uh, this laptop uh, that uh, all the drivers are being provided by Ubuntu. However, go ahead. No, that's fine. We just, I just want to make sure you remembered it. Uh, however, uh, there was, well, if you want to explain it, that'd be fine. There is something that was kind of odd that we noticed, and it's kind of a result of, we think, this thing just being so damn new and have, needing to support uh, the newer GPU, the 970 that's in here. When you go into the Ubuntu additional drivers after you get this machine and you open it up, uh, it's a little confusing. It didn't. I, I felt a little dumb. It says down here, it says, no proprietary drivers are in use. But, but then, then at the top, it, it says that it's using the NVIDIA driver. Yeah, but then in parentheses, it says open source. source. Which I don't... So and then, and, then, and then below it, it says there's the Nuvu driver, which is not checked. So below it says no proprietary drivers in use. But then up above, the NVIDIA binary driver is checked, and it says in parentheses open source. And as a matter of fact, of course, the NVIDIA control panel is installed, so I can actually go into the NVIDIA control panel and... You know, verify that here is the proprietary driver's control panel. So obviously it's installed, and we were a little confused. Why is the system reporting no proprietary driver when obviously there's a proprietary driver installed? We scratched our head a little bit, and you and Rika did some Googling. Do you remember yeah. what you found? Well, the solution, the, the, the answer we came up with, and I wouldn't say we necessarily got this on Google. I think it's mostly a guess, but the, the, what we're getting, what basically what we've ascertained is that the driver isn't included. The NVIDIA driver isn't included in the official uh, in the repositories to install it. So they installed it manually. They installed perhaps it from, System seventy six did. Yeah, they did from NVIDIA, and because it is so new, the uh, Ubuntu the kernel can actually track that hardware ID, and so it has no idea what exa- it doesn't. Even, I don't think it actually knows that it's NVIDIA. So it just knows that there is a package installed. Now, why it flags it as open source and why it flags is not a proprietary driver, I don't have an answer for. That could just be a function of the Ubuntu software. Or, uh, I and think updates so. Applet, I how think it reads so. It. But so the the theory is is maybe to what was it to support the 970 and G Sync and newest, all of that. Yeah, that the new the, the, the newest graphics in 1504. And, right. And, yeah. So and by no means do not take that as the word of God. It is basically at best an educated guess after screwing around with it a little bit and, and researching. But that's our guess. Yeah, and it looks like Reno in the chat room says that uh, his uh, Ubuntu 14403 Mate does it now. You know, I don't. I don't normally. I'm not a my my daily ins- driver is Arch, so I don't see this page that, that screen that often. But I never remember seeing it like that. No, that's that's definitely something new. I actually once. Once Rakai kind of hit onto that, I actually think I have the exact same issue going on on my desktop at home because I have a very new graphics card on my desktop at home and uh, to support my, my six displays. And I think that I actually have that exact same issue. I, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, we're going to keep playing with this and take this down to LinuxCon too. So that's something we might uh, 
Reno says he has that, and he has an old card. So it's something we're going to play with. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is if you have any questions about the laptop or anything like that or any comments, tweet me at Chris LAS right now. And uh, we're going to do a, show, a video after the show. So mm -hmm. if you're listening live, tweet me at Chris LAS with your questions about it or your comments. And we're going to do a video Q&A response and have that posted in the show notes. And in that video, we'll also take, give you, uh, we'll, we'll hold it and we'll show you what it looks like to hold it and, and look at it if you want to look up and close at it. So we'll have that in the show notes for additional content if you're listening and decide you want to get your eyes on it. And you have any questions, tweet us at Chris LAS on Twitter. And we'll have that video posted in the show notes. And hopefully we can hang on to this for a couple of days and maybe do a follow-up just after we've used it for a week or two. Because mm -hmm. we've only had it for a few days now, but it's perfect timing to get it out to LinuxCon. We've got our hands on it. I want to tell you what is, you know, this is a great option. There's a lot of machines out there, but one of the things that's nice about System76 is this is a rig that's going to support Linux in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're producing a quality, solid product here. I, I, I would very much like to own this machine. So yeah, that, that's, that passes the benchmark yeah. for me. I want it. I got I got I got uh, a little uh, a little less for it. And that's that's where I come down on on laptops like this. I, there's a lot of people out there that are going to look at it and say, well, why not buy this or why not buy that? And the reality is is uh, there are plenty of good laptops out there. I don't think any of them make bad laptops. But what one of the things that you get when you buy this particular laptop is you're voting with your wallet, and you're supporting a company that wants to see Linux on the desktop succeed. And that's not the case if you buy from almost any other manufacturer. Mm. Uh, and there are some practical things. You know, you I've and I are talking about, you know, the the you know some of the companies that have screwed yes. up with the BIOS and stuff like that. Been You're not going to get that with System76. Been messing with firmware. The other thing I've been thinking about with System76, and I kind of thought about it when I was unboxing this machine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have the nice art in the box now, but yeah. they also have, like, the little robot guy that comes. In a way... They are also Ubuntu and Linux ambassadors. They well, yeah, are for a lot of people like your first experience, mm -hmm. and so it's like when I when I started using the machine, I was I come at it from that perspective initially. Like this is my first introduction, and I can't think of another company I would rather do that. Like Dell is going to blow that. Yeah, Lenovo couldn't care less. Uh, HP might want might want one day care, might not. Like all these different companies, nobody cares about that ambassador role like System mm -hmm. seventy six does. Mm -hmm. You know, so. There's that element to it as well. If you're buying for somebody else, if you're if you're a business transitioning, things like that, there's a certain element of that mm -hmm. that I think is is really nice. So, anyways, I was I was I was very impressed, and uh, it's it's been fun to play with, it. and it's finally been like one of the big workstation killers that really makes me want to replace the Bonobo after all these years. It's been it's taken a long time, and it's kind of appropriate. It's another System 76. So, anyways, that is right there. The Linux Action Show's look at the Serval Workstation Desktop Murderer. And that brings us to the end of this week's show. But no, before we get out of here, we got to do some feedback. Let's do that. And our first one comes in from Leonard B. And uh, Leonard B. writes, I love the video show, but I did not notice that... Uh, oh, wait, what? I love the video show, but I did not notice that Last 377 was audio until you started talking about it. Uh, when, I, when I, though, about it, when I thought I realized it, the quality of the show was markably improved. I also like the Kickstarter idea. Even if you decide not to go back to video, maintain the high-quality experience in Last 377. Following up on the Kickstarter idea to make it possible would be a good thing. I don't remember the Kickstarter idea specifically. The Kickstarter, I don't think it was the Kickstarter. I think he's referring to the Reddit that said maybe what we should do is ask the people in the community to come together to have a solution for us, a uh, video solution. Here's you know, I think that's what he's referring the to. the thing is... Uh, I think we do that in in the best ways that it makes sense already. Like, yeah. um, um, because the thing is, is like you got to really be an expert in this stuff. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're working with people outside of L Linux Action Show who work with this stuff, and I want to increase that. And I want to invite people who are in video production who want to know, like, what do you need from a production standpoint to work with us? Because we 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 are very proficient in the technical aspect, and we could work with somebody to help spec that out and things uh -huh. like that. Uh, and I wanted to sort of address something else, and I don't know if this cuts into other feedback, but uh, just because we're doing right now an audio edition of Linux Action Show doesn't mean there isn't still a video component and doesn't mean we're not still going to invest in video, but what we want to do is do it in sort of project forms and, and really kind of conquer it in a project so that way we deliver you something as video. It makes sense that that would be a video. Even if it's something dumb, like taking a quick handy cam and showing you a laptop, that just makes more sense in a visual yeah. aspect, so we'll do that. Uh, or if it's something nice, like going and doing interviews, we really want to invest in that approach when we do it. And, and otherwise, we want to really invest in the content. So 
videos become something special that we do from time to time that are, are worth your time and very focused. And so when people find them, it, the video title is exactly what it, what, what it says is what it is. It's not a two-hour video. It's a 10-minute or 15-minute or a five-minute video, and it matches exactly what the title is. And then you get a splash page at the end that says, go listen to the entire Linux Action Show at this URL. They're great. Go listen to the rest of the show. And we, when we put out video, it's, it's worth it. And otherwise, what we can do is focus on making the best quality show using the, using the best open source technology and, and focusing on the content. And that's what's exciting about this format. And mm -hmm. we're doing it as an experiment for a little while. It's not necessarily a final transition either. Yeah. But I'm really curious to see if when we double down on video and we really nail that, if we get it right and we double down on audio and we nail that, we get it right, if that just doesn't really work super well together. It might actually turn out to be very complimentary. You know, the, part of it is, uh, I think that, I think, and we said this, I think, last week, or maybe it was a week before, is that you don't understand, I, I think some people just don't understand exactly how many problems it caused and, and the effect that it had on the show, because they don't see us, you, they don't see how upset you got, they don't We uh, try to how, keep it out of the show. I think some people pick up on it, though, even if they're not well, watching well, sure, live. Sure, sure. We also got some feedback, people like, yeah, I kind of stopped watching live because, uh, you know, you guys seem stressed out all the time. Yeah, and so, it took three hours to get that yeah, solved. And, yeah. yeah. So our second piece of feedback comes in from Jeff P. And Jeff P. says, hi, Chris and Noah, I've been a listener of the Linux Action Show for a long time. I've never really been a regular viewer of the show. I only watch the show on occasion when I can catch it live. But I subscribed on Pocket Cast app, by the way, a great app, on Android, yeah. and listen every week. I recently have been feeling as if the audio listeners have been forgotten about. When listening to the show, I often felt I was missing out on some of the content because I was not watching the video. Because the content seemed tailored more towards the video audience, I finally decided I would subscribe to the video feed. The very <laughs> next week, you guys announced that you're moving to an audio-focused show. But, 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 I just subscribe. Vid All right, uh, fine. By the way, I'll just go hit unsubscribe. But seriously, I love the show, and I'm thrilled you guys are changing the format. I will continue to enjoy this podcast as an audio-only format every week. Keep up the good work. So that guy has the right attitude. Yeah, that you was know, that was pretty funny. You know, the uh, the the funny thing about that is. Uh, I think we just started to drift because we'd always talked about it. Even mm -hmm. when we were doing tutorials before we decided to make the switch, I was like, hey, remember, we got to keep the audio yeah, listeners in yeah. mind. It's just. Well, actually, that's not what you said. <laughs> actually, what you said is, please keep in, please keep our general audience in mind. And I'm like, OK, ha, ha, well, uh, what? <laughs> I don't have time to explain this to you right now. I'm starting a show. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, but that doesn't make any sense to me, Chris. <laughs> no, I said, please keep the majority of our audience in yeah, mind when you're right. making the how-to yeah, yeah, today. Yeah. Which yeah. Did, that did made no sense to me. I'm like, oh, of course. So so, so, what you mean is like, keep in mind that they're not all Linux users? Or no, keep in they mind are that Linux users. No, well, that's not, not all what, of them. <laughs> well, no, but the majority are. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I, uh, I, no, what I meant was the majority of our downloads are audio. I got that eventually. And so, but when you create a how-to, it's pretty difficult to make one that works well in audio and video, as you discovered yeah what well, it, it's definitely more work i think it's doable yeah it is but people complain uh, too we get complaints oh, a little really bit. there still? was well it was you know people watching the video thought it was kind of boring to hear you spell out the command yeah but yeah well okay okay yeah yeah okay so from that perspective so then then so then the next thing you compare to is take a look at the uh, at the uh <clears throat> level up your land yeah. episode right and that is something that traditionally we would have used a ton of video to do oh my gosh and it actually it's a segment people. we might not have done just because of the sheer amount of video production required to pull it off maybe yeah, i think we would have done it i think it would have just taken a week or two to plan and it yeah. would have involved me taking three days off work to film outside but with linux con coming up and stuff there's no yeah. way we would have oh, had we any... done it then no yeah, yeah. But uh, that but that episode actually was remarkably well f fed back from the audience, and they, they really enjoyed it, even though we told that story through the lens of an audio a listener rather than, than a video listener. It worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. The uh, Windows 10 video broke. Uh, Windows 10 broke the video version. All yeah. right, so Ken H. writes in. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. I don't really care about what you use to broadcast. Video or audio only doesn't matter. It's the content that's great. You guys keep me informed of all the Linux news and introduce me to the hardware and software. I bring Lass up every Monday morning and listen while I work. Really good broadcast get replaced a few times during, or get replayed during a few times at lunch. Keep up the great work. That's awesome. Wow, replays. Yeah. And so to, to some of the people that, that seem to question this, know that this is, this is very, very representative of the people that have emailed in. There's one or two people that, uh, that mm. said, I'm not real happy about it. I ha we've gotten zero, zip, zilch, none of people that have said, listen, I'm just not listening to the show anymore. Well, we'll get them now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The YouTube audience has been the most vocal. Yeah. They yeah. don't like it. That's which the, that's makes the sense. exception. But yeah. it also, YouTube is also the one place where people don't have to put any real effort into leaving feedback. They just, they click on the comment mm -hmm. box. And so how much do, does that person really care yeah. as composed to the people that actually send into the show? So I, one, one comment that kind of rubbed me the wrong way just a little bit uh, that we got a few times was, um, well, this makes it easier and cheaper for them to do it now. 
And no. <laughs> uh, that kind of makes it sound like we're making a change because we're lazy. Um, and to imply that we're not working hard on this show just kind of ruffles my feathers a, a little and bit. B, the <laughs> amount the amount of the amount of work that has the, the amount the sheer amount of work has gone up. Yeah. The amount of work on air has gone down, right. which makes the content better. That's but the exactly. The actual right. total amount of work has right. probably quadrupled. Yeah. That's that's it exactly. It takes three it. people more to actually do the show. Yeah. <laughs> it, it 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 takes a, literally an entire day longer to post produce the show. Right. Everything has gotten more difficult, more complicated, yeah. it, more hard. And we're paying another editor. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a cost that's gone up. But, well, I know. But I mean, really, there's a cost there, too, yeah. associated. We're, we're, we've hired another editor to edit it, to make it all happen in one weekend. Um, and so we're, right now, Rika is, is working with uh, Ham Radio to make all this possible. And it's not um, <clears throat> it's not much because uh, Ham Radio is, uh, is working with us as we scale. But um, we are doing it because we want to make the best version of the thing we make. We don't want to make a compromised version of the thing we make. And we want to make the thing with as much open source and Linux software possible. There is, however, logic to creating something that uses the least amount of things necessary from a hardware and technology standpoint possible. Less points of failure. <clears throat> right. And it, it's going to make shows on the road much more doable, much more sustainable. And what we're trying to find is right now the Linux Action Show is on June 10th. It will reach its 10th anniversary. And what we're trying to find is maybe by the time we reach that, to really get, we really want to be in our groove for whatever new thing is. Because once we land into whatever it's going to be, I feel mm -hmm. like we're still then going to have to develop a little bit. Like if we decide, hey, you know what, we're going to go all in on audio and we're really going to do this, mm -hmm. then our conversation no longer goes, oh, what's the pros and cons of audio versus video? Our conversation goes, how can we create audio content like we've never created before? Yeah. How can we do something we've never done? What can we do that's new? And <clears throat> I think that's going to lead us down some extremely interesting paths for stuff that's specifically produced for our show now. And, and, and let us be really focused. <clears throat> so that kind of stuff, we may I, that's where I want to be by June 10th. If mm -hmm. it's video, if it's audio, I want to be there by June 10th. And so that's what we're doing now. And whatever that is, we become gazelle intensed on, yeah. on making that content. Yeah. Everything that it can be and right. crushing everything. Right else. now, this is feeling good because uh, we got in. We started setting up ten after nine today for the for the live stream, mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, "Oh crap, we're already late. We're yeah, already yeah, late. Yeah, crap, yeah. crap, crap, crap." I'm like, dude, we got forty five minutes. Yeah, we're you're basically like, there. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'm like, whatever. And and really, we were ready to go by nine twenty five. Yeah. Because I'm really glad you got stuff. that camera turned on and set up. I know, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Old habits die hard, yeah, man. Old habits. Yeah, yeah. They got the camera feed. I, I turned. I actually turned on some of the lights and then turned off lights. So I turned. I turned stuff on. I didn't even have to turn on. Uh, and so it, what that really meant was we spent that morning using that time. Uh, we ran additional benchmarks on the serval. So this morning we got we got uh, two additional benchmarks in that we normally would have spent that time getting all of the uh, video production elements set up. That's really awesome. So I feel like the content has has seen a has seen an upgrade essentially, mm -hmm. and our excitement has seen an upgrade, our passion has seen an upgrade, and our our range for discovering new things has seen an upgrade. So if you like where we're going, well, this is really just the tip of the iceberg because then then once we really commit to it, that's when we're really going to create trying to create something extremely high quality, something that we're really not seeing anywhere else. Um, that's sort of the goal. Yeah. Well, well and the, you know, the, the other thing is too is, and you said it, you know, right after we got off the air the other day, things were just tighter last week. It was. It was just. It, it was just you and I. The, the flow of you and I working together was just that much tighter. Mm -hmm. Not having that video component, and that might be a technical limitation. And, uh, it, it might just be. Uh, it might just be a, a social mental limitation. We got a comment too about the audio quality. That I was really proud of. <laughs> yeah. Because internally we had a benchmark, yeah. and I don't even think we ever verbalized nope, nope. it. We said we want it to sound as good as if Noah's in studio. Yep. And one of the, I think one of the comments we got in was like, I couldn't even tell if Noah was in studio or not. Yeah. And I was like, that's what we want. We want yeah. every episode to sound like that. And uh, yeah, and we're gonna try to. We even have theories and and don't know how possible it's gonna be. And we'll yeah. probably fail a few times, but we have we have theories on how to even produce that with guest interviews. Yeah, and I mean the thing is, I cannot do. I can tell you right now, it is just this is just a function of being a one man show. I cannot get that level of audio quality 
and be on camera at the same time. Unless all you want to watch me do is monkey with things, because to, yeah. to make that happen, yeah. I had a I bought a brand new mixer mm -hmm. and I sat in, in, in a new microphone, and a new headphones, mm -hmm. the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. and I sat in front of it and I was tweaking everything the entire time. Every time I take a breath, every time I caught, yeah. I mean, yeah. and that the, requires the me secret not to, to radio, the really really dirty secret to radio to make radio work really well, and it's super distracting if you're watching us. Is we're doing five things at once. Yeah, exactly. I'm we're, I'm yeah. working the mixer. I'm yep. moving things. You're reading chat room. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm changing. And shot and we're if if you were to watch us it would look like we're not paying attention but it's just actually the rhythm you develop after you've been doing this for a long time and being able to say I don't have to care about that camera I don't have to care about the, my presentation I care about the show and the content it frees up like 20% of my brain processor for the show like just during the show it's like it's so great and then not have to worry about any of that before the show it removes all of the dependency of that so I really liked it I really enjoyed it I hope the audience likes it if you've um, <clears throat> Traditionally been a video listener. Noah and I were also saying, you know, we've also made the transition as an experiment. We've transitioned some of our video shows that we are watchers to to audio. So we could kind of go through the same transition with you guys with a show that we listen to frequently. I also listened to last last week. It's been a little while since I've actually downloaded and listened to, my, to our own show, which is actually yeah. if a you, good if, thing to do. If you do your own podcast, yeah. it's hard to do, but you should really listen to your own show because it's it's a good way to learn what you're doing wrong. Uh, and it sounded really good. I listened to it in the car. The levels were super nice. Um, I just, if I invite you, if you've traditionally been a video listener, maybe change your routine a little bit. Listen somewhere else while you're doing something, maybe like driving or in the shower or mm -hmm. whatever. Get naked and listen to the Linux Action Show. Right? Yeah, that's that's what you want to send people home with. Yeah, that's the one thing we're going to miss on video is the is is my reactions that's to your, true. To your uh, in, insanely off ball uh, comments. There is one cost that is going to significantly be reduced to your Jupiter Broadcasting. Do you know what that cost is, Chris? Um, drive space, hair product. Oh no, that would imply <laughs> that would imply that the I hair know, does not look amazing the anymore. Hair, hold on now, let's let's set the, the record straight. The, the hair still looks damn good. Come on, come on, look at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and and, and what did I say this morning? What I, did I say? I, <laughs> what did I say? Do you really want to repeat that on air? Yeah, why not? Okay, he's he's like. Oh, I need to shave. Oh, actually, I don't need to shave. <laughs> I don't have to worry about shaving. I said that, yeah. Because I'm, is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about, I was like, I was like, oh, I don't have to, I also said I was going to have to, I got ready to start to go comb my hair, and then I realized I don't have to comb my hair. Oh, I miss This that. is uncombed. Sometimes I don't I listen to you. I'm just going on the record. Oh. I, sometimes? Yeah. Sometimes? Sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. The only time, this is why I have to do show you, is the only time you listen to me. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com to give us your feedback on episode 378. Also, any stories or applications that you think are great on Linux or uh, great open source projects you want us to talk about. Any conversations you want to jump in, your insights are always really appreciated, and your votes. linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Your feedback, go to Jupiter Broadcasting and click that contact link. And uh, just send in some uh, some feedback for the show. And uh, also, check out the calendar to join us live. The chat room is now more important than ever. We are putting our community front and center in our video. And in a sense, in a very real sense, the content now is becoming open source because you can, you can contribute. You can provide source material links. You can maybe make corrections politely, I hope, uh, and engage with us. And that gets captured now front and center. And I think there's something big about having a Linux podcast, having its community front and center when... Linux is community powered. So we'd love to have you join that, jblive.tv, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to find the live time, and then you can hang out with us. Also, Naked. check out <laughs> Linux Unplugged uh, episode, uh, what, geez, what was it, 105 last week, I think. We talked about Mycroft, which has been blowing up this whole weekend, and we talked about it on Tuesday, with, and, the guy, and, and uh, the guy that created the open source intelligence behind this Mycroft uh, project um, is uh, joined us. And, um, and they also just this week uh, announced uh, that... Uh, they are going to be using Ubuntu Snappy. If you're not familiar with Mycroft, it's a little tiny, like, uh, it's like an open source version of the Amazon uh, Echo. And uh, it has all kinds of functionality, and it, it does, obviously, um, things that are a little more privacy-focused, too. And we talked with the guy behind the open source artificial intelligence that will go out to the world uh, if this project uh, is backed. And that was a great episode. It was funny because in the pre-show, we covered the, vid the Kickstarter project just to kind of chat about it. Mm -hmm. From the time we talked about it in the pre-show to the time the intro music was done playing... The guy that created the artificial intelligence software was listening and joined the mumble room and just we had an on the spot interview with him, just totally impromptu. It was great. He's a listener of the That's show. That's the advantage so. of open source, isn't it? He's a, he's a fan of the show. We've had him on the show once before, and he's just a great guy too. He's super knowledgeable. So it was, uh, yeah. And it's gonna be live this week. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna be at LinuxCon doing Linux Unplugged. Don't know quite where or how, but uh, you come join us and also be in the mumble room. 
And if you're going to be... When he be, says he doesn't know quite where or how, what he means is we have absolutely no, even a, a, even a concept of how we're going to do this. Right. We just know that we're going to do it. That's our intention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank goodness there's only audio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? And the thing is, too, if you want to join us, uh, like bring like uh, your phone and mumble and a headset or something if you're going to be on site and you want to be in the mumble room. Because we're not going to have mics for everybody because that's crazy. But if you're going to be at LinuxCon and want to be in Linux Unplugged, bring yourself a way to be in the mumble room. Or oh, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or... or just join us in Mumble wherever you are in the world, and it's like you'll be at LinuxCon during the show. Yeah, just put a picture of us up, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you can sit there. If you want to get in our, Mumble is an open watch. source uh, voice chat program, and you can get our Mumble details by going into our IRC chat room and doing Bang Mumble, and you can join us at Linux Unplugged. Check out the calendar for lifetimes on that. That should be a good show. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, what is the main disadvantage to not having our faces up on the screen while we do the show if we are still showing things like news visuals. Like, so if we're talking about a story Mm -hmm. and uh, we have the visual of the thing that we're talking about up on the screen. Well, what's the main dis? So, if you're now think about you when you're watching a podcast or listening to a podcast, like why, why, why would you prefer to watch a YouTube video of something over listening to it for some reason if you get to see them? So, I was a video guy. I never actually listened to the Linux Action Show. I always watched it. So, I yeah. can really relate to the people that really like video. That said, okay. Uh, when we before we before we decided that we were going to make this transition to audio, I wanted to know exactly what I was what I was quote unquote losing. So I can't really do that with last because <laughs> I can I can visualize everything in my head because I was there when we did the show. But what I did was I went out and got another podcast that I've always done video in. Oh yeah, and which I one? downloaded. Uh, you, don't say, you don't have to say. You yeah. don't have to say. And I downloaded just the audio only p- portion of it, and I listened to it. And uh, I've actually totally switched now. I actually don't download the video one anymore, and I just completely <clears throat> switched audio. And you know what? And here's the thing: it worked because I said in my head. I told myself I was like, "Is there? I want to actually evaluate. Is there? Is am I actually losing something, or is or is it just because we are no longer doing one aspect of a program? Does everyone just assume that the show has somehow gotten worse? And I think the reality is the audio quality has gone up. I think the content goes up because I think both of us are more relaxed actually doing the show. Yeah. And the only trade-off is we have chosen. Not to not to concentrate on not to focus on the video. It's not that there isn't video. There is video. It just it, it's the video, of the chat room, video, of the screens, whatever. <clears throat> right. Every so occasionally, you fl- you flip to the um, the webcam last week because you showed me your new you know ambiance. Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, so it's interesting because I also made that transition from video to audio for a show. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, what you I, think? I did it a long time ago, oh, so okay. my my memories aren't quite as as current about it. But what I do recall is uh, <clears throat> over time, I think it felt more personal uh, over audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're we're still in experimentation phase, but yeah, uh, nothing's in stone stone, but. Uh, but here, so I guess, can anyone, can anyone, so. Here's what I, before you go on, I just want to finish this thought. So, <clears throat> and you give you time to put that mm-hmm, together. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing is, is what I feel like we can do in audio is we could do an exceptionally competitively good quality show. And I feel like what we end up doing in video is an adequate, but not quite good enough show yeah. in terms of quality and yep. production quality not necessarily content aside yeah. although i think the content's better with the audio too yeah but I, I guess it's like if i had to choose between putting out something that was exceptionally good in what it does or something that was mediocre in what it does yeah i uh yeah i just kind of prefer to do the audio <laughs> yeah and it's it's not like the other thing is the uh, just one other thing and then i'll stop interrupting you. i'm sorry no, you're fine if you take out the the search and discovery aspect that youtube brings us see what's really hard to quantify about youtube is it's not the views that each episode gets that's not what's important about youtube yeah it's important that people find us on that youtube and then right. come to the website if but so if you took out that aspect of what youtube gives us discoverability and you just looked at it from a raw numbers of people who watch the content on youtube uh-huh we don't even count the YouTube numbers in our reports to the sponsors because they're so insignificant compared to the downloads, the downloads from the yeah. website and specifically compared to the audio downloads. Yeah. And so for us, 
when I think about that, that to me does indicate the video isn't super critical to the business. Yeah. If when I'm actually generating revenue to my sponsors, I don't right. even report the YouTube numbers. Yeah. I don't even know how many subscribers we have to our YouTube channel. I think it's actually a decent amount. 50,000 or so, I think. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's not bad. But it's just not a key part of our formula still, even after all these years. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, then the other thing is, is like I, I, Ironic Badger says, is it's like, you do, don't you just kind of want to make last the biggest and best show possible? And if that, to get there, you have to do video. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, yeah, I do ask art. I like that. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So YouTube has a pretty important role. You know, a lot of people found us through, you know, three or four or five or six different sh videos they found over time. And then they came here. I guess one thing that's really irritating is people, uh, for whatever reason, have gotten this idea that uh, that we we can't like. There's no there. I can't. Nobody can give me a, a solution on any platform of any of anything that we can use that would that would actually work for for remote video. Uh, that not that I'm aware of anyway. Well, every time you say that, then we get like a dozen links to WebRT so at least WebRT so which don't work. Okay. Uh, or I, I guess so. I but I don't. Does it sound like we're complaining? Because we're not. We're just. This is the technical challenge we're kind well, of kicking. Actually, around. really, if you if you if I mean honestly, what we're doing is responding to to oh complaining <clears throat> to complaints. Yeah. Oh, so it kind of sounds like complaining because we're responding to complaints. Yeah. Because we're not. We're not. It's good. Actually, I think this has been a nice transition. It's been a nice switch. Um, and I'm looking forward to going to LinuxCon and recording some audio interviews. <laughs> <laughs>